This week on the Ocean Cruisers podcast, I'm having a chat with Dan and Kika from Sailboat Uma. Dan and Kika have been cruising now for nearly 10 years on their 1972 Pearson 36, which at the time was a scrapyard salvage boat, basically, and they've refit the boat over the years multiple times to become a very unique all-electric sailboat. They've put in some good miles under the keel, have cruised the Caribbean extensively, sailed across the Atlantic, cruised Northern Europe, and are now upgrading Uma in the Med. If you want to come sailing with Dan and Kika at the Odyssey Sailing Festival in the BVI's this December, there's a few cabins left in the flotilla. Visit www.theoceancruisers.com backslash odyssey to check out what the festival is all about. But for now, enjoy the chat with Dan and Kika. Yeah, so why, why are we doing this project? We, um, we bought this boat. Unfortunately, we paid money for this boat. Um, they should have paid us to take the boat. Because uh, it was on the way to the scrapyard when we picked it up. Um, and at the time, we just didn't have um, the budget or the knowledge or the skill to do all the work necessary. Um, but we kind of knew that. And so we just did the bare minimum to get the boat floating so that we could get out into the Caribbean and learn how to sail. Because neither of us had ever been sailing before. Um, and then we just slowly and progressively um, did updates and refits and modified things along the way as we needed them. Um, you know, we needed sails and an anchor and a keel and a rudder when we left and a boat that didn't sink. And that's all we had for the first like two years. Uh, and then we, you know, added the toilet and the kitchen. And so we were in the middle of, you know, sailing and upgrading and sailing and upgrading. And then, um, we had the boat pretty squared away when we crossed the Atlantic. Nothing broke. We had we had one switch uh, short circuit to turn the motor into reverse, like forward and reverse when we were sailing across the Atlantic from when a wave came into the cockpit. And that was it. Um, but yeah, we've, we've tried to be pretty proactive on our renovations and refits. Like we can kind of tell when things need to be done and we usually try to fix them before they break, uh, which yeah. is been a pretty good for us so far we haven't had any like major catastrophes <laughs> out sailing um but the there's been a major problem with the boat ever since we got it and that was uh well the, the keel like structure was all messed up so we we glassed that back in but they picked us up and put us down on the hard when we had no floors or structure in our boat and so when they put us down it sort of like changed the shape of our hull by you know two centimeters or something like that or like an inch if you're in freedom units. Um, and so when we glassed everything back in, it sort of changed the shape. And then when we tightened the rig, the knees, you can't quite see them, but the knees with like the chain plates, the lowers hold on, kind of like bent in the side of the boat a little bit, which we found out recently was a real issue on the 10 meter versions of these boats. And they recalled all of them to fix it. And the 36 foot boats, which are like this much longer, have the exact same knee structure and they didn't recall them. Um, so it's like a known issue with these boats that that area of the boat is just way too weak. So that's all delaminated. Um, and in order to access that, we had to rip out a bunch of stuff. And while we were at it, we kind of kept ripping stuff out. And then it sort of just snowballed into like basically all the way down We've to the hall and all the way back up again. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And the reason why we're doing this here is because after, you know, we, we, we didn't want to do this project when we were sailing up to Norway. Yeah. And when we made it into the med, we realized that if we're going to stay in a place for several months up to a year to do this project, we might as well be in a med because then we can enjoy yeah. it at the same time. Yeah. And Traveling so, yeah. around is easy. I mean, we're in Sardinia. It's absolutely beautiful. And while the boat's all ripped out, we're living in our truck on the beach. So it's basically the same lifestyle, <laughs> uh, which we love. Yeah. And it's cheaper as well. I think if you're going to do... Well, I mean, if you're doing this in Norway, it'll cost you a fortune because Norway's super expensive. I don't know what it's like for boat And also winter. Boat parts. Yeah, we yeah. can't... We yeah, needed yeah. to be in a place where the climate was relatively stable uh, and not too hot. Like in the Caribbean, it's too hot to do fiberglass work in the summer. Um, and even in the winter, it's, it's kind of too hot. And up in Norway, it's too cold in the winter. You can't do anything. So... Um, when we, when we put a water maker in, in Norway, we had to glass in like a little bit of supports and it took like four days with heaters on it, just like constantly. Cause the, the ocean's two degrees Celsius. And so you've got ocean that's two degrees Celsius, one centimeter of fiberglass. And then you're trying to glass on the other side and you're trying to heat it up for the epoxy to kick. And it's just con you're battling the entire ocean with like a little yeah. two kilowatt heater. heater. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Didn't work. Yeah. Very well. Not going to work. 
So here's going to be a much better place. And everything here is so close together, like traveling wise or even finding material yeah. and finding parts or finding even like the right contractors to help us with this project if we need to. Like everything is easily accessible mm -hmm. as opposed to a place like when we were in Guatemala, for instance, we did a lot of work done and the labor is cheap if we needed help. But the problem was material. Like yeah. we could not import anything in Guatemala because it was it, it would take two months <laughs> one one gallon of of paint you know that would cost maybe 80 bucks in the states you would probably cost you 160 in importing fees and it would take six months to yeah. import it to Guatemala so that's that's the compromise right now we're in a place where labor is very expensive because it's like actual like proper wages where people can live off of it um, but all the material and everything we're in like the heart of sailboat fixing country so um, yeah, we have access to everything we need here and the, and the experts that yeah. we need more importantly. Yeah. It comes with a, a compromise as well because of places like here, especially in Italy, you don't find a lot of places that let you work on your own boat. Like we've asked almost all the shipyard because ideally, originally when we got here, we thought we were going to haul the boat out and do the work on the hard and then when it's done, put it back in the water. And we talked to, I think, like seven or eight shipyards and mm -hmm. all of them had the same answer. They were saying, no, you, you have to use an Italian licensed contractor. And so we were wondering, okay, is this even possible? And then finally we found a marina that says, well, you can do it in the water as long as you don't, you know, make a mess, make a mess on the outside. <laughs> we're and trying our so, best. Yeah. And here we are in, in the water doing this project by ourselves. <laughs> I think it's nicer if it stays in the water. Like, like you guys have I've gone through years of doing various stages of boat work, but like your boat being on the hard for an extended period of time, and like you have to go for a hike every time you want to use a toilet, you have to climb up and down ladders at yeah. night. Like, it's it's horrible and it's demotivating. And I think if if you can keep it floating and keep doing the work, at least you're floating. You know, <laughs> it's not that bad. You still feel like you're on a boat. Yeah. It's much less hot as well because half mm -hmm. our boat's still in the ocean. So. You know, we have we we got like a cheap air conditioner for the middle of the summer, but now we don't really even need it because the the water temperature is what the inside of the boat is, um, and on the hard it's just way too hot. And the other problem with us is if we hauled out, um, we'd have to almost build some sort of like custom made cradle to hold our hull because then otherwise we just otherwise it just changed and it caused all of this in the beginning, which the hull would deform or change shape or like be twisted a little bit funny or it would, it would be yeah. really tricky if you're not gonna like put the boat back in its original mold. Yeah, because so. I think the beauty of being in the water is the boat already is sitting in a natural that it wants to be. That's if you take it out wants. of the water, change the ship, and then you put it back in the water, it's just going to try its best to like find a shape again, and you, it's just counterproductive. So I think yeah. in the water makes the most sense. And we, we actually asked, like, there was an engineer that came in to help us with the lamination plan, and we asked him the same questions, like, do you think in the water is better? And he was like, Actually, I think it's a great way to finish this project because, yeah, the boat sits in the position that it wants to be in and you don't have to worry about adding more pressure to push it as if you were doing it in the hard because then what's going to happen, you're going to push it out with weight and then after the project is done, it's just going to keep trying to add the pressure to mm -hmm. bring it back to the same shape and that's when you have problems. So, like, yes, you can do it on the hard, but then you have to have... A specific way to hold every single point equally yeah. otherwise it defeats the purpose yeah mm-hmm yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can like kind of like maybe hand tighten it, but like so the point where your mast isn't going to fall over. Like our mast will self-support 
without any rigging on it. I mean, not under load, but like we could have left it up and it's not going to fall over. But some of the newer masts are so thin, I swear in a bad windstorm, if it's not tight, it's going to break. It's just going to snap in half anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. So, yeah. right. So obviously, like there was some structural issues with the construction of um, of the boats. I mean, to, honestly, you've done really well. Like Pearson 36s, they were not meant to be pounding across oceans like the way no. you guys have Which done it. Which is weird because you know, like, you've sailed them to the max. Now that we're ripping our boat apart and we're showing all like the construction flaws, everyone's saying the same thing. They're like, yeah, Pearsons are kind of shit boats. They're not so good. They're meant to be coastal cruisers. When we got the boat, everything was like, oh, Pearsons are great. Their hulls are this thick. They're super strong. Like, I don't know. Like, it's, it's, maybe it's a bit of an echo chamber, but like, like, we didn't hear anybody say this boat was crap when we got it. And now everyone's saying like, oh yeah, that's kind of a shitty boat. And we're like, where were you guys 10 years ago? <laughs> well, the feet, like, it's an old boat as well. What year? It's a 70s yeah. model. 70 72. Yeah, so she's pushing 50 years old. I mean, that's amazing. Like, right? how many cars do yeah. you see that are 50 years old on, like, flat terrain, on newly laid concrete that haven't managed to, like, stay apart? But you've, like, right. smashed that boat across yeah, exactly. oceans and it's 50 years old. And it was made with, like, yeah. resins yeah. that we are 50 more... years old. It's amazing. <laughs> right. Yeah. We sailed more on this boat in the last, I mean, nine years, or even, even in the last two years that this was had ever sailed in 50 years. Yeah. Because, like, the owners, the previous owners didn't do much, didn't, no. you know, coastal cruising. Motored out to a to a harbor in the weekend and stuff. We When we sit, when we first had the boat actually heeled over in the Bay of Biscay, sailing, like, full sail, you know, kind of rail in the water sailing, there was uh, the bilge pump kept going off and we're, we thought it was something to do with the keel because like, you know, we just fixed it. And it turned out that like there's a the scupper drains, like the deck drain, it goes up, uh, it's, it's, it's glassed into the hull for a, a ways and then it wise off and like the deck drain goes in one and the bilge goes in the other. And we found that like where those two fiberglass pipes were leaned up against the hull, it was leaking from behind there because it was just like a fiberglass pipe set up against a hull and they never were like glassed it in properly. And which means that like in the 40 years prior to us owning the boat, nobody had ever healed it over that far nobody had ever healed to it discover to notice. that problem to notice. So <laughs> it never like, sailed. <laughs> no. no, pretty much. It had been, it had been uh, like probably beached. I think it had some hurricane damage from Irma and it probably hit some rocks motoring around in the northeast of the United States, but it had never really been sailed. Yeah, that pretty much it. Well, I mean, it's like a lot of yeah. boats. To, I mean, there's not many boats that are actually made to cross oceans or built with the concept of like, this is going to be an ocean crossing boat. There's very few. I think like yeah. a bunch of companies have done a really good job of making boats like yours and like mine, where it's like, yeah, you know, you can coastal cruise it, you can take it around Europe perhaps, but like for constant ocean yeah. passages and beating into heavy waves and big wind and stuff like, there's very few that are actually made for that. And even the ones that do make it for that, yeah, they don't make up that well anyway. So, like, I think no, um, we're trying yeah, to fix think... that. That's for another yeah. podcast. I, yeah. I think yeah. that's it's interesting because the this like this specific boat, yes, it was built fifty years ago, and yes, it wasn't meant to cross oceans. But even as a coastal cruiser, like they cut so many corners yeah. as we rip everything out that we realized that. They would prep areas to fiberglass to the hull. Well, you, you can see it behind behind Kika over here. Yeah, that's like, the bulkhead. That's all the tabbing on our main bulkhead. There's like there's like a little bit up here, and there's like a little tab down there, and then that's there's it. like huge gaps where they just didn't even bother. And they, they prepared it like so they they grind out like they they prepared the the wood to be fiberglassed yeah. in, but they just never fiberglassed it. So it was interesting because we saw so many corners cut, the things that you would never notice by just buying a boat because not a lot of people take all these things out from their own boat and that's yeah and i think that's the, the main issue there is like i think there were a lot of companies building boats tried to save a lot of money to make more profit and so yeah they cut corners thinking that well the you know people buying these boats are never going to try to cross an ocean so why should we bother making yeah. a solid boat even if we could they were just making kind of cheap things to sell to the Joneses. This kind of segues nicely into this whole like, thing about us fixing up our old shitty boat because a lot of people are wondering why we're fixing up an old shitty boat. They're like, you guys should just get a new boat like, or get a different boat that's better and then fix that up. But the, the thing is, like, 
we know the issues that our boat has. We've been sailing it for 10 years. Like we know exactly what they are. We've been daydreaming on how to fix them for 10 years. So all we need to do is execute. If we got another old boat, then we'd have to sail it around for two or three years to figure out where all the problems are and then rip it apart. And then like, we'd still do it anyway. Um, and if we got a new boat, it would definitely fall apart. <laughs> <'Cause>, like, <Yeah. laughs> the amount of, the, like, like we're not spending three or 400 grand on a new boat even if we had that kind of money, like A, we're not going to go into debt for it. That's just not a, like in our like religion. <laughs> um, but also, like even if we had that cash lying around, we wouldn't spend it on a new boat because the the stories that we hear from people who buy new boats and take them out to commission, like it's 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 not it's not like it squeaks a bit. It's like the door falls out mm -hmm. or this whole ceiling liner falls down or there's an electrical fire or like it's like real problems from real manufacturers of real boats that are new that have awful issues and you know maybe some of it's still covered under warranty but like i don't want an electrical fire in the middle of an ocean i don't want we had some friends on a catamaran and their whole their whole like sliding cockpit locker fell like door fell out half crossing, crossing the atlantic landed. Yeah, because they didn't put screws in it. They just glued it in and it fell out. I yeah. think, I mean, we're, we, I, we're going to try to not talk too too badly about manufacturers out there, but there's a lot of manufacturers that don't I'm do I'm fine with bashing boat manufacturers. Control. I'm absolutely fine with <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, some I'll, people I'll are going to hate specific. us after this conversation. Well, no, no, I'll be very like, specific. Like, <laughs> I'm very open about thing, this. <laughs> it would be one thing if like a new uh you know typical mass production meant for the charter market boat was a hundred thousand and it fell apart but they're like four hundred thousand dollars you know like that's a lot of money mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like if it was like 80 grand for a boat and you know it wasn't the best of condition like cool like that's the price of a nice car it's like it's a lot of work i get it but like 80 grand you can buy a really nice car that's not going to fall apart for 50 years like you can go buy almost any consumer grade truck or rv or camper like but then you get into boats and you're like half a million bucks and it's going to fall apart in the first year and yeah. the mass is going to break because it's too thin and the keel's going to wobble when you hit a rock and like no <laughs> yeah. just no and also i feel like they don't they don't do a proper yeah like i was saying they don't do a proper quality control like they build the boat and then they ship it to the owner directly I hope after it doesn't fall apart and then if they forgot like if the not necessarily the designer of the boat but if the the, the person that's building it um forgets to like check on the screw somewhere yeah. then like the whole thing falls apart and they don't even realize it because they didn't they didn't properly test the boat after i think everybody that's built should go in the water have it tested for a few days up to a week and then be okay this is what needs to be redone and then ship it to the owner like some sort of like quality control yeah. multi-point checklist i mean i'm sure that they do to some extent um but from the stories we've heard from new boat owners it can't be that thorough <laughs> I don't think it's thorough so, at all. I, I think they probably test the first one out in the mold in a swimming pool. <laughs> probably yeah. they definitely don't test yeah, yeah. like how the rigs are set up and is it suitable. That's all done with yeah. like you know computer modeling and stuff like that. They definitely do the first well, one out. That, mold. Um, but as far like, as a production line, there's boats. no general testing. No. Well, what they do with race boats where they like have because they're new technology where they have to like prove that they can rewrite themselves and all that stuff like they should be required to do that with production boats yeah. like even more so because a race boat is is crewed by professional racers like they know what they're doing. Um, whereas they still most snap in half as well. <laughs> buying a sailboat don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I think the problem. I mean, it, the the problem with that theory too. It's like yes, I think properly testing a boat before sending it to the owner is good, but also not a lot of owners. It, I feel like it's kind of like the mileage in a car, right? Like if you put the the new boat on the water, you test it heavily for a week, and then you ship it to owner, then the owner is getting technically a used boat. Yeah, yeah. But like if somebody wants a new shiny boat, then they want it straight out of the factory. In that case, yeah, things are gonna break because there wasn't enough quality control to it well the problem is the problem is that, that boats are built in one place and they're often always commissioned somewhere else because they'll either go on a cargo ship and sent or they'll be sailed across an ocean or motored across an ocean and then they're always commissioned like by some yard somewhere else and so there's so many like people working on them throughout its 
you know, chain of like it's build phases that um, it's really hard to like quality control that and manage all that. Yeah. That's what I think. So to yeah. go to go to the like, why do we not have a new boat uh, question that then was trying to like answer in yeah, a very yeah. short amount of time. <laughs> I think that we keep saying if like the day that comes that we can build our own boat the way we want to with the specs that we want it to be without ever going into debt for yeah, it, yeah. that's when we probably will have a new boat. But that, you know, that takes time and money and we rather spend less time and less money yeah. on UMA right now. We've still never seen a, like a, a boat currently on the market where like, even if we had, no, okay, so up to a certain point, probably around a million dollars, then you can build whatever you want. But yeah, like in that sort of like production consumer ready, like, for a mid 40 foot boat around three to 500,000. Like we still haven't seen one. We're like, Ooh, nice. Like if we had a half a million dollars, we'd buy that. But like every boat we've seen, we're like, even if we had it, we'd still want to gut it. So what's the point of buying a brand new boat if you just want to rip it apart anyway. And, um, yeah, I mean, we could buy another used boat for like 20 grand or 30 grand and then fix it up. But we, we, we've already done so much work to this boat. And we've already like figured out all the systems that, I mean, all we're doing is like fiberglass and plywood. It's not that expensive. It's and you know, like this, man, itchy, there's, there's so like, many discussion points in like what compared to buying the, the, the points that you just made there, like about the industry and about testing and about you know, what type of boats you're actually getting for the money that you spend in like, I think they do need to do well first of all like boats are made for the charter market unless you're going out and you're buying like an oyster or a moody or a naiad you're buying a boat that is made for a charter market and that effectively for is sure. like buying i don't know it's probably like a, a caravan trailer that is never meant to leave an rv park yeah. but you are now yeah, like touring exactly. it around the globe like it's probably something similar to that yeah. like the engines the chassis they're not going to be built yeah. the same yeah, and even the layout, like you're settling for, yeah, you're settling for a layout that you're not even, you don't even like, and you're, you're trying to force it. For a half a million dollars, you're you settling can, down for a layout you don't like? That doesn't make sense. Everything from a 32 foot to about a 60 foot is a three cabin, three head layout. <laughs> yeah, from the main manufacturers. <laughs> they don't yeah. really change. And the thing is as well, yeah. it's like, with, it's like with, the, with the companies that actually make better boats, they don't make that many in like the 30 to 40 foot range. Like hardly any actually. No. There's not many do it. Yeah. Um, and the, the ones that do don't feel very well. Like you're, yeah. you're buying a, like, like the, 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 the problem, problem that, that it seems is just like the charter boats are relatively light with relatively high aspect ratio sail plans. They actually sail okay. They're just built like crap. Whereas, because yeah, they're built, they're, 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 yeah, they're, they're, they're built off of and trickle down like race tendencies, like the twin aft helms, the big wide triangles, like, you know, fin keels. Um, so like they don't sail that poorly, but there's just no storage space and they fall apart. And then the other side is like the, the heavy blue water boat sail like crap because they're so heavy with these big long keels and like these big heavy displacements that they just turn into motor sailors and they have like a generator and a diesel and one or the other is always on um, because they're too heavy. They're, 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 they're either too heavy to sail well or the system requirements on board because of all the hydraulic furlers and the autopilot are so demanding that you have to run the generator just to sail the boat anyway. And so it's very, very rare to find something in between where it's just like, it's heavy enough that it's not going to fall apart, but it sails well with a high aspect ratio, you know, uh, sail plan and it's comfortable and it's livable. Like there's, we could kind of only think of one or two manufacturers that even get close to that. Um, cause otherwise they're, they're too heavy yeah. and too slow. Which ones do you think actually? That's an interesting question. <sighs> the only one. So the, I think the Garcia Expedition ones are pretty good for aluminum because as, as they're, they're sort of like a production mm -hmm. boat, even though aluminum, we're talking production, not custom, but the interiors are so yep. like narrow mm -hmm. and small and like claustrophobic because they're meant to be like blue water sailboats. So there's no living space in them. Um, yeah. And even those for the well, money, actually. like we've, we've been on a few and for the money, you know, you kind of like run your finger under the countertop or like check the, the detailing of them. And you're like, for, for, for $750,000, you guys can't like 
round off your Corian. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> those little, little things, things where like, it's like, if this, if this attention to detail is here, like, what can I not see? Mm -hmm. um, another one that we haven't been on personally, but it ticks a lot of boxes is the Pegasus. Oh, which I, don't I think know they only have like three or four out there. Yeah, I think they have like four boats or something. Um, they, uh, but it 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 looks livable. It looks fast and light. It's all electric, um, and it's a decent layout. I mean, we'd still change a lot, but like mm. they they have like a whole. I think it's a Pegasus where like the whole uh, saloon, like the table and the the settee around it, gimbals. So, oh. like, when you're healed over at 10 degrees, you know, for days on end, you can just rotate the whole thing so your table's flat. I mean, it's kind of nuts, but that's actually that, really that's like a custom owner spec thing. <laughs> I've seen that with a navigation table. Uh, kind of. But like, <laughs> yeah. But, but those type of equipment, it requires a lot of power. It's all hydraulic. It's, yeah. a, it's kind of a huge waste of space to put all those hydraulics in there. And, like, and then everything, it, like, there's tons of wasted space around that volume because that volume has to be its own, in, like, separate thing. But, anyway. but it's an in innovative, at least, they're, at least with the Pegasus, they're willing to think outside the box. Yeah. Like, the problem that we found with monohull specifically, as opposed to catamarans, is that the catamaran industry is not afraid to be innovative to, yeah. to to invent new things to try out new things like if you look at the new catamarans out there and their delay out the technology that they use like it's all different in a way but they're pushing the industry yeah. forward right with the monohull it's almost the opposite way everyone building monohulls is trying to go backwards like traditional times yeah, yeah. and nobody's trying to push to you know new technology is trying to push to innovations and the one thing like with the pegasus for instance like at least they were thinking outside the box with the gimbaled saloon yeah. idea well it's got a weird like twin wing keel like it's instead of one keel and a bulb it's got like two i don't even know what to call it there's a there's a name mini it's keels in, no there's a name for it it's in um shoot i can't remember oh, like a bilge keel the, or... no it's not a bilge keel it, they're they're in front of each other like that um, but oh, there's a name I've for it. It's in like an old design book. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. But um, yeah, it, that, yeah, exactly. Like the catamaran industry, it seems like every week there's a new catamaran manufacturer coming up with some new innovative solution to how to mm -hmm. make a catamaran. Um, and and like every one of like progressively, every one of them is getting better and better. You know, on on your on your yeah point chart. Like sometimes not so much, but sometimes they do. If you're like a catamaran from like the 80s and 90s, they were Oh, the wild the difference to what they are now. <laughs> they were yeah, terrible. Yeah, really uh, they had no idea then. what they were doing. It was like the inside was super small and you could fit like 40 people in the cockpit. And now they're like trying to figure out the space balance. I mean, they're all so much better. Mm -hmm. That's probably why so many people are starting to move towards catamarans, even though they're more expensive. Um, I don't personally i don't think the motion is more comfortable but it's just different it's more choppy no it's I different think with catamarans the motion so i think catamarans at anchor are where it's amazing because can be if the <laughs> swell isn't just wrong and it you're depends if you got the swell on yeah. the beam then the horrible it's, yeah, that's exactly. true it's it's it can be more comfortable movement. Yeah. Yeah, but what, while sailing, we've been on a few catamarans while sailing, and it's just a different like motion. Like at least on the monohull, like you you kind of sway with the waves, right? But on a catamaran, it's kind of like very on the like subtle on the like, very um not subtle but very choppy, choppy very very rough. This is boat life. <laughs> yeah. For those people who yeah, are like, a hollow shell. I only watch for the sailing. It's like this is part of sailing. <laughs> Like it's been ten years. Like you need to do a major refit usually, usually around, around ten years, years or so. Like yeah. that's how long boats last before you need. So to that was ten years ago smaller. when you bought that boat. Well, well, nine, 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 nine years, years. but, oh, but ten, 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 ten coming this. October. We're starting from like a negative year, and like so we because <laughs> the boat was in such rough condition. Like we weren't coming out of like a nice new refit and then sailing for ten years and then doing a refit. Yeah, it was yeah. twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen, we bought the boat. Uh, right this time, October, uh, September, end of September, twenty fourteen. Yeah. So nine years, and then next next year will be ten. Mm. Oh my gosh! Man, this, yeah. this but we've we've nice thought so about the boat in thirteen. So yeah, for us too. This whole re this current refit's gone by really fast because in in a weird way because like we've been we've been in this marina since February, so we're pushing nine months, and it's been like. We've gotten a lot done, but at the same time, it feels like we haven't even started yet because we haven't started putting anything back in. Like we're still ripping stuff out. Um, but we've had like a lot of other like 
personal and private things that have gone on this year that have slowed us down. But it's, it's also just such a big project that like, and it's just the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten like, you know, we talked to experts about how long it would take them to do certain parts of this project. And they're like, oh, this would take us like three days. We're like, three days? Like, it's gonna take <laughs> us a month. And they were like, oh, okay, so four guys working eight hours a day without filming, you know, you divide those hours up and that's like, well, it's just the two of us. We can't work eight hours a day because we've got like other things we have to do and we're filming it, you know. And so, we're learning how to yeah, do it at the so same it's time. Like, yeah, they know like what they're doing. Our month. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So our, our month is like a, a regular crew of four people's three days. <laughs> so it takes yeah, us it's like X10. 10 exactly. times longer to do anything because we have to film it and we have other projects we're doing on the side. And so, yeah, I mean, it does take longer. Um, and, yeah. you know, I think we have as to well, motivate though, right? ourselves through... It's, it, your obviously you've got a balance of like do you spend money and get other people to do it or do you do it yourself and it takes 10 times longer well it's like there's no guarantee that it's going to be done to the standard yeah. that you deem suitable anyway if you get someone else yeah. to do it um exactly. and also I, I think working on your own boat is great because like if you're going to sail a boat for another five years work that you do now might break in five years anyway even if it's fiberglass in like the boat might stress you know you might get fractures and tabs whatever and like, if you've put them in there in the first place, you know how to fix them. You know, you've probably got the materials left over yeah. from the last time you did it. So I think if, you, if you're independent <laughs> off grid cruisers, like you have to give it a shot at least. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and we're always motivated. Like I remember when we first started out, um, there wasn't anything on YouTube about any of this. Um, and so we were reading old books about people doing this back in like the 70s and the 80s, taking old CNCs. Like I remember reading one book. Uh, I think it was called like two against the horn maybe something like that and it was like a okay. couple who got uh a boat in the 70s 34 38 foot something like i think it was a cnc or some ericsson some fiberglass thing similar to ours and they took it around cape horn um but they uh somewhere down in argentina or i think it was on Ch i think it was on the chilean side actually they got hit by a storm and like the boat washed up on the beach and like beached itself, ripped the whole side of it apart. And they were there for like a week. I'm probably butchering the story for anybody who's actually heard it, but this is what I remember <laughs> from reading. Um, and they got like the Navy pulled them off and like they put ballast on one side so the boat was floating sideways so it wouldn't sink and they towed it around to um, the, the town down there, Fuego something. Uh, and they, they put it up and they like took plywood like molds off of one side and mirrored them on the other side and they re-glassed it yeah, all like enough. down there in some random like fisherman's shipyard and they were like gluing splintered wood back together like and they put it back together and they so that was like half of their sail and then they finished their sail back up to their side and it's like those types of stories are the ones that motivate us to keep working on our boat now because like we don't live in the same culture that they lived in like everything is throwaway and disposable now mm -hmm. and everyone's just like ah oh, that boat's done like get a new one we're like what are you gonna do with this one? It's gonna get ground up and put in a in a you know a landfill somewhere. Like why? Like we can spend a year of our life, we can spend you know a few thousand dollars of our of our money, and we can put it back together and it'll sail for another fifty years. Like there's no reason to throw stuff away just because it's cheaper to buy a new one. Like yeah. that shouldn't be a reason to do anything in life. It's, yeah, it's like pursuing things just because it's cheap. <laughs> Or different or new or yeah. just because the other one is slightly broken yeah. you think you have to get rid of it yeah yeah you know i, I saw we this commercial a once and it was world. such and um, it was it was aimed at you know uh, sustainable clothing or whatever and it was from um pretty sure it was levi i'm pretty sure it was levi and um yeah the tagline was that levi jeans are the most sustainable clothes ever made in like the history of the mm. human race <laughs> and i was like that's yeah. a bold statement like where'd you come up with that and there right. was like you buy those things and unless you're like you know ripping them they last for years like i've got jeans that i yeah, literally yeah. bought yeah. when i was like a teenager and i've still got them <laughs> like they last yeah. for yeah. ages all my jeans are yeah. still from levi is just yeah they they're good die. and you can actually like if you're looking you can actually buy it's something that it's a marketed thing that they develop too because you can buy jeans the, the same traditional jean from you know 20 years ago and it's just patched a little bit and you can wear it normally now yeah and i think the same thing with uh patagonia they have the same motto it's like you can like they'll actually 
if your jacket or your puffer jacket or anything is ripped, they'll take it for you and, and they'll it, put it yeah. back together and they'll send it back to you because they're like yeah. a, a fixed used jacket that will last you forever if you keep up with it. Like Always you can better. fix it, you can patch it, you can do whatever you want, but don't just throw it away just because it has a little bit of a hole. It was the argument I used to make when we were renovating houses, when we would paint trim, um, and your homeowners would be like, oh, you should use latex paint, like water-based paint, because so, it's like better for the environment than oil-based paint. Um, and we we're like, well, do you want to re repaint your trim every three to four years, or do you want to paint it once and have it last for 50 years uh, <laughs> yeah, and never paint point. it again? And they were like, like I'd argue the oil-based paint is more sustainable because you're using one gallon every 25 years rather than one gallon every two years or three years. Um, yeah. Because it's just less durable. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of our our take on it is like you know we'd rather keep this boat floating because we can there's no reason you know no one else is going to put this boat back together the way we will um so we may as well and whether we sail for a year or sail for 10 when we're done like that's not really the point the boat will still be around sailing long after we're done with her yeah yeah no it's the right it's the right way to go about it i think as well and it's like it's just such a shame especially right with, they're not that common in europe because um I don't actually know what they do with scrapped boats in Europe because there's no boat scrap yards. Landfill. But I've seen like some of the, uh, sh yeah, landfill, yeah. But you don't see them getting crushed that much or taken away. Like I don't really know what happens to them. But in America, it's pretty straightforward because you have a lot of boat scrap yards and the boats do stay there for quite a long time. And people like come and pick off them and take the bits they want. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's such a waste because <laughs> it's like the materials that are actually used to like make new boats are pretty horrible yeah. for the planet really like yeah. resins teak plastic like paints that are involved and like to just toss one out that's already gone through that process yeah. to then just get a brand new one <laughs> this is just also going through that yeah. process and you're not necessarily yeah. getting a better boat you might get a worse boat you might get a boat that they try to keep the lead. less solid anyway yeah, yeah. exactly like, i mean if you don't have a boat at all and then you want a good boat and yeah if you have the funds for it then like but you can get, look into a new boat get a but... good new boat don't get a cheap <laughs> shitty one that's going to fall apart in five years you know yeah. like this whole like recycle your boat every five years thing is nuts mm -hmm. like maybe you're not going to be the one sailing it but like a boat should like fiberglass is kind of indestructible it should be around for 50 or 60 or 100 years like there's no reason it shouldn't be so i think yeah. they should have a new motto for boats they should say you, you know when you go to an airbnb and then they say like you leave uh you leave the place in a better condition than you saw it yeah campground they should do the same thing for boats like when you're done with a boat you should give it to a new owner in a better condition than when you got it so like you're motivated to actually fix the problems that you saw yeah. along the way and then you give it back yeah i mean it's kind there's of no amazing. value in it but at least It'll you know dream, that that it? boat will survive longer I yeah, think that it's would amazing kind of be a been, like like <laughs> these old you know they they started building fiberglass boats in the, in like the, the early the late sixties early seventies, so it's been fifty five sixty years and we still haven't come up with a way to recycle fiberglass properly. I mean they still grind it up into no. a powder and it goes into a landfill. They keep the they, you can you can you can melt the mass down and you can melt the keel down if it's not encapsulated, um, but yeah it's. It's kind of nuts. In fifty or sixty years, no one's come up with like an end of life plan. In uh, in 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 my ideal utopia, things wouldn't be allowed to be built unless they had uh, like a full cycle, full um, cradle to grave like life cycle, where it's like you're not allowed to build something unless you can recycle it. Yeah, that would be. You know, it's be it's hitting utopia. on like a good point that you were talking about before with like the quality of how boats are actually built. Like, I would love to be an advocate for. I don't want to say regulating because I don't like governments anyway, but like maybe they can be useful in this occasion, but like actually regulating the industry so they're producing stuff that's like safe, fit for purpose. Because if they say, if if they sell, if, you know, like if Beneteau sell a 45 foot sailboat, you're just going to presume you can cross oceans on it because it's big, you can live yeah. on it. Because of like the it's size. Well, because it's got, an, yeah. it's got an A rating. I mean, they've rated it yeah. to be an ocean crossing boat. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they rated themselves, right? The it's, it's like nominating yourself for a competition you're going to win. Our, that's yeah. our whole issue. I want to know what that rating is actually like, based on as well. Yeah. It's nothing. Like, it's, yeah, yeah. it's sure terrifying it the lack of what, like, like, have you ever seen a boat that doesn't have an A rating? I haven't. 
<laughs> like, no, it has to have like I've, an I've enclosed living space or like, something. Like that's it. Justified buying boats. Like I was talking to one guy in the yard in Greece, and he, it, 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 the, the boat was actually good. It was a Grand Soleil, which, which with a with a swan hull, so it's actually you know decent boat, fast. You probably wouldn't want to mm-hmm. cross oceans on it. But um, he was just like, oh, you know, it's a great boat. It's got an A rating. I was like. Well, it doesn't mean it's a great boat. So what it is... means it's a boat, basically. That means it has like a life raft. <laughs> it means it deep floats, boat, doesn't it? Like that doesn't mean anything. Um, no, yeah, it literally I, I doesn't think... mean anything. Like you don't even have to have a watertight bulkhead in front of your rudder post for an A rating. So like all the Benetos and all those with the with their um, Jeffa um, spade hung rudders. If you don't put that little nut in just right, and your rudder falls out, your boat's sinking. Or you get hit by an orca, your boat's sinking. Like, losing your rudder should not sink your boat. You should have a watertight bulkhead in front of it. It's, mm-hmm. it's insane that most boat yeah, manufacturers don't. Like, yeah. 99% of boat manufacturers don't. I, th- I think, sh- I think you're right. There should be a way to... Super easy. There should be a way to redefine the ratings for boats, right? But in a way that's more universal. It's not just like, oh, A rating, but the company that defined A rating is the one who's giving their boats a rating it doesn't it's really matter strange. it's 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 our whole issue with like the term blue water boat versus coastal cruiser because like the coast can be a horrible place to sail depending on where you're yeah and norway the ocean can be like really chill like if you're going on an atlantic crossing from cabo verde to the caribbean not during hurricane season like you can literally take a stand-up paddleboard across people have done it you know what i mean like crossing an ocean doesn't define a, a big achievement you know it's just like you can drift down wind for two weeks cool you can cross the ocean like it's not difficult but that's but that's not the same thing as going from the uk to canada you know upwind across the north atlantic like that's that's a whole different boat <laughs> yeah or and, even like tackling like rough coast like if you're like the the what's the name of the the coast in the u.s that the cape is it cape fear yeah, yeah. Yeah, like like Cape, the really Cape Fear there. area, it could be really, really bad. Worse than an Atlantic crossing. Well, any, so. Anywhere that you have wind against current can be really bad. And so, like, the the idea that there's a difference between coastal cruising and blue water sailing, in our opinion, is just how much water can you carry, uh, how much backup gear and spare parts do you have. Um, diesel, you know, how like, much diesel can you carry? Yeah, like, like, do you carry some extra sails? Like, the difference between a coastal cruise and a blue water is you have a full set of secondary sails. You have multiple ways to car- make and carry water. You have a, enough food storage to last two months. Like, like that's what makes a blue water boat. Is like you're you can't get to a grocery store or repair facility. It has nothing to do with like how well the boat sails, how safe the boat is. Because like, you can be coastal cruising and sink and be in a life a life raft for for eight or nine hours and you can be out in the middle of the ocean and sink and be in a life raft for eight or nine hours like in mm-hmm. today's day and age if you've got an epurb and a plb you're not going to be in a life raft for more than 24 hours like you're just not so yeah, that's not even yeah. the that's not even the requirement anymore it's like will it sink won't it sink it's like yeah but like yeah, there's so many ships and there's so many airplanes like and there's so many ways to communicate mm-hmm. with emergency services. It's not just like a flare at a passing ship, hopefully. So, yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's interesting that there's still a definition between blue water and coastal cruising because it's, it's such a made up. Like now that we're living in a truck, we like to compare it to like off road. You know, it's like, oh, it's an off road capable vehicle. It's like well, so it's a good comparison. Fiat Panda. You know, it's like a Fiat Panda is a great off road vehicle, but you won't see that in any four by four shows, you know. Like the Italian, like we yeah. make it to places in our truck and then we're like, oh, that was really tough. And we get there, there's a freaking Fiat Panda from like 1980 parked there with some like park ranger. And we're like, how? Yeah. <laughs> how did it get but, there? Yeah, it's, it's, well, they're so light. Well, they like, just go over anything. That's right. <laughs> well, and yeah. it's the same thing with like off road. It's like, so what you mean is off pavement, but we've been in countries like Haiti where the pavement is shit. <laughs> and There's no in, pavement. It's and we've just been in some pavement. countries like Canada where the gravel roads are great. <laughs> like, like define off road. You can't. So like you can't define off road. So you can't define an off road vehicle. You know you can't really define yeah. blue water. So how can you define a blue water vehicle uh, mm-hmm. boat? Like it's it's weird. It's a weird thing that we're all still using as a definition that doesn't mean anything. Well, everyone's got their own take on it as well. Like, for me, a blue yeah. water... Well, it depends. I'm like, 
Yeah, I mean, there's no sense in it. Ideally, like I would like to classify like a blue water cruising sailboat is a boat that has been specifically made to take a beating. And and they know that the boat will take a beating because of where it's got to sail. And, you know, you can stay on the boat, like you said, two months. You know, you've got a thousand litres of water, you know, a few hundred litres of diesel, whatever, good storage space, space to store yeah. secondary sails, stuff like that. Um, but I don't really think it means that anymore because there's no there's nobody really making boats for that purpose anymore. And why should they, in a way? Because well, there's hardly anybody, a... does it? I always say this, like, what you people do um what you know a lot of people in this community do is so rare there's no there's hardly anybody actually yeah, yeah. like buying sailboats to cross oceans yeah well and and now with you know like for us our number one piece of safety gear when we crossed the ocean was satellite weather forecasting and our number two was yeah, yeah, our very mm -hmm. because if we don't know the weather that's coming and if we're tired when it hits because we've had to hand steer like we're going to make bad decisions like life yeah. jackets like EPIRB, life raft all that is secondary and so in today's day and age if you've got satellite weather forecasting you don't need a blue water boat to sail anywhere in the world because you can pick good weather and you can sail around Cape Horn with a spinnaker and sunshine if you have patience and you can wait two or three weeks for good weather. Um, yeah. So you're not getting like caught off guard by tropical storms and like you don't have to survive a hurricane offshore. That's insane. So the boat capabilities, like we'd rather have a faster, lighter, more maneuverable boat that can sail upwind really well than a big, heavy, full keel, you know, tank of a boat because we'd rather not get hit by the storm. We'd rather like avoid Sail it. away from it, yeah. <laughs> like when we were crossing the North Atlantic, there was these big um, uh, low pressure systems that spin clockwise, no, counterclockwise, uh, coming down from the north. And there was low pressures that spin clockwise coming high up from pressure, the south, yeah. or high pressures we we're trying to avoid. And so we're just trying to like snake our way between them, staying in that like 20 to 30 knot downwind range. So we didn't run out of wind because if we crossed lower, we would have had to motor, which we can't do. Um, but yeah, I mean, our, our Atlantic crossing, we definitely would have got hit by hurricane force winds if we didn't have satellite weather. Uh, on a daily us. basis. Yeah. So we were able definitely. to like make decisions even on our boat, which isn't very fast and be like, oh, let's sail a bit further south for two or three days and let's come back up for two or three days. Um, yeah. If we had sailed a straight line, we would have gotten wrecked. So to, to a certain extent, it's not, it's less about the boat itself. It's more about you know, the men in the box. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, but also, like, every boat built should build a boat that's capable of taking a beating, right? Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like, they shouldn't take in mind, like, oh, this, somebody that's going to buy this boat is only going to sail in the lake. Therefore, I, this boat, if it goes into bad weather, it's going to sink. But it's okay. Nobody's going to buy it for that. I it's would... like, no, you should buy, you should build a boat properly with the properly, like, water type bulkheads that it needs to have. Yeah. Because the person that buys it that wants to sail along the coast and gets hit by a storm needs to be able to maneuver the boat properly yeah. and safely knowing that it's in, you know his decision is going to get him safe but the boat is also not going to sink yeah i think you should be able to like hit a rock without your boat sinking i think you should be able to like lose your rudder without your boat sinking i don't think aft helms like on the back corners with nothing to hold on to uh, should classify a blue water sailboat. That's there should be terrifying. a warning sign that it's a, no like, really like we um it's so, so we, bad we, did, we were on oh it's it's terrible. We were on one of those and and the problem with the new like triangular boats, all the Benetos and Chinos, like all these ones with the twin aft cabins, twin aft helms, is when they heel over, they don't heel over along the center line like a regular sailboat. They heel over like on an angle, like you're tripping over your front feet. You know, like like a there's a reason that three wheelers don't exist anymore because they're super dangerous. Um, but then that aft windward helm, you're like two or three meters above the ocean, looking down at the ocean with nothing between you and the ocean. Like it's absolutely terrifying. Like I would never want to sail across an ocean on a boat like that if I ever had to go to windward once. Uh, it would just be s well, terrifying. I don't know. It's downwind as well. Like we, um, so we did a raft up a few weeks ago, and this the the boat that we've got. It's a Juno fifty four DS, and by their own admission, it's probably they say it's the best boat they ever made uh, in terms of like mm -hmm. a good production boat that's actually suitable for going offshore. Um, and anyway, we were rafting up next to one of the newer ones, which 
you look at it and they're beautiful. They're so nice inside. They're so spacious, yeah, yeah. much nicer to live in, guaranteed that. Um, but in terms of like the saleability of it, I'm like, there's like three inches in this bilge. That's not great if you start taking on water. No. Like the, the helm no. stations at the back, you've just got like a, a lifeline and then it's straight, yeah. you're straight over the edge. There's no combing. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah. No. Like you literally nothing. just walk straight yeah. off. I was like, if you're going down the Atlantic bed. and you've got some, you know, yeah. big old waves coming over your boat, you are literally just going to be in a wave. Like, <laughs> there's yep. no yep. way around it. Yeah. And if the companionway is open, that wave is going to go straight into your build that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, like, like watertight bulkheads in front of the rudder, like more better protected sailing positions and, um, companionway doors that like are actually watertight are just like no brainer requirement. That should and, be a standard. And yeah. heel step mass for goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so, just about saving yeah, money. Like, I mean, the thing is like, if you look at the, yeah. who, who they're making boats for, uh, they're making them for charter companies. I was speaking to uh, somebody who works at Genoa a few weeks ago and I'm sure, uh, sorry, yeah, Genoa, and they were talking about the whole Beneteau group. I think it was the whole Beneteau group. It's it's like above ninety percent of their sales just go directly to charter companies. So yeah. they're not even like if one out of every ten thing you made went to somebody, you wouldn't cater for that person because no. it's one out well, of ten. And I think that's the it. issue. That's also right? fine though. Yeah. Like like if you're building a charter boat, <coughs> build a charter boat, but don't call it ocean worthy. You know what I mean? Like like there's that's nothing the wrong problem. with that. Like if we were gonna go rent a boat for a week with friends, we would rent like a Bali fifty two or like some big ridiculous thing. Like that's what you want it for. You want a floating apartment that can sleep enough enough people and have super spacious and a big swim platform that goes down. Like it's perfect for what they're building it for. And we don't have an issue with that, but like, don't call it a blue water boat <laughs> or, yeah. or come up with a better term than blue water boat because it's yeah, a stupid Yeah, call it anyway. your charter line. Like, yeah, exactly. the, and, and if somebody wants to buy it, they know what to expect, right? Then, but they don't buy it because it's in a way it's false advertising because you're like, oh, this is the best boat we've ever made. Yeah. Anybody can take it and, and use it as their home. It's like, no, you build it specifically for the charter industry, not for somebody to take it as their home and sail around the world because something's going to happen on this well, boat. But then, but then the, the, you get a secondhand one out of the charter market and you sail it downwind across the Atlantic to the Panama, downwind across the Pacific to the South Pacific. And like, that's not a proof of a good boat, like period, like, it's downwind drifting, you know, you need a decent autopilot and you need some patience for two or three or four weeks. Like, like just cause you've done a downwind run across the Atlantic doesn't mean that it's an ocean seaworthy vessel, you know? Yeah. Um, it's but actually I the easiest too, sailing you can like, do. <laughs> Yeah, 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 there's a whole maritime mm-hmm. museum in Norfolk we went to, and there's this little six foot bathtub with a sail that the guy sailed across the Atlantic. Like, like getting yeah. across the Atlantic just means it has to not sink for three weeks <laughs> like, and just yeah, drift basically. along. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you think about it, too, not to play devil's advocate, but most people that buy a boat do that route. Yeah, which is you know fine. they buy it's it in the med and then route. they sail across <laughs> and then they they spend their time in the Caribbean yeah. and they go to the Pacific with the Panama Canal. All, right? Yeah, it's just great. Like it's chill. It's it's warm. It's sunny. Like we, like mm. since we've left the Caribbean, we fully appreciate trade wind sailing because it is so much harder to sail in the north, oh, yeah. in like Norway or in the UK or in the Med, where the wind is all over the place all the time. Like it's way harder than trade wind sailing. We get it. We love trade wind sailing, but it's really easy sailing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, <clears throat> I think I, like, I've I've really started to appreciate the concept of crossing over and going to the caribbean sooner rather than later because like this season has been terrible for wind like there's just been no wind or there's been days where there's like 40 knots of wind and like there's just not much yeah. sailing happened at yeah. all it's just been a lot of motoring and that's when like i was actually thinking yeah. about you guys the other day I was, having, I was having a conversation with my wife about this in the cockpit about how it is just a shit location for actually owning a sailboat because you don't get to sail that much although it's really pretty around here yeah um what is your guys' plan for actually cruising the med if you're brave enough to do that? Because like you've definitely got well, limitations with the motor and generating uh, energy for it. Yeah. So in the beginning, I mean, honestly, we didn't think about the med as because people people kept warning us like in the med is either all wind or no wind at all. Like be careful, especially with the electric motor; it's not meant for the med. And we didn't really pay too much attention for it because 
in our minds, we're like if there is two knots of wind, there is wind. Yeah, like, yeah. You can, can make really light like wind. our boat is very is relatively small, and we have relatively light sails, so we kind of prepared for that. Yeah. And our mind was like, okay, if we know there's going to be a forty knot, you know, mistral or something like that, then we're not going to sail in that. But in the lighter wind, we can definitely put the code zero. We can put the mm-hmm. spinnaker out. And that's kind of how we've been sailing in, although we haven't gone this far in. We're only in Sardinia. <laughs> so we did two <laughs> islands. But um, I think, but we kind of caught that, uh, that theory too, because we were leaving Gibraltar and into the Med and the wind was like sh- funneling into the nose and we mm-hmm. had to tack like a lot. And also yeah. the wind kept dying. Like we had a friend with us and she had, she was in a bit of a tight schedule. So we ended up motoring and we had the generator running for a lot of that passage. But when we were by ourselves, we just went really slow. Right. Like we just had yeah. to consume The thing with the med is it's one big swimming pool. So like when the mm-hmm. wind dies, it's not like there's still a leftover swell. That's what's really uncomfortable is out in the ocean when the wind dies, but there's still a two meter swell. Yeah. Um, because then you like, and you're on beam on that, which hasn't really happened to us ever. And if it does, like it requires 300 Watts from our motor to keep the bow pointing like down the waves and you mm-hmm. can keep going. Um, but the beauty of the med is that it doesn't really matter what direction you point your bow, you'll make it to some country and you're allowed to be there. So like the, maybe if you don't go too far south. <laughs> I was going to well, say, like, it depends but, who's traveling. It's like, turn up in uh, Libya, yeah, like, out of Egypt. Yeah. Um, but, like... Depends on your passport. That kind as of we ties were. into the whole, like, blue water boat thing. And a lot of people have, like, one head sail on a roller furler, one main sail. Maybe they have all three reefs rigged. Probably not. And then they rely on their engine. Like, people are like, oh, I motor 80% of the time. We're like, well, do you have a code zero? Do you have a spinnaker? Do you have a storm sail? And they're like, no. We're like, of course you motor all the time. As soon as the wind's under seven knots, you have to motor or mm-hmm. your boat doesn't move. Yeah. Um, like we were supposed to sail from uh, Menorca down to Caligari on the south coast of Sardinia. And we started sailing and the wind shifted. So we put our, and it got light. We put our code zero out and we ended up going over the north coast. Um, so, you know, we change where we're going based on the wind. That's kind of the point of having a sailboat, in our opinion. Uh, if you're constantly fighting the elements and you're constantly fighting and you're constantly on a, on a schedule, get a powerboat. It's cheaper. Like, sails cost a lot of money and you have to replace them every, you know, six to ten years. Yeah. And rigging costs a lot of money. And, like, um, we had some friends uh, who did the calculation based, like, from a trawler versus a sailboat and, like, how much you have to motor versus how much you sail. And they... Uh, in the places like the Bahamas where you have trade winds, like maybe you can sail, but it has to do with um, how your boat's set up as well. Because a lot of the charter boats don't have solar. They don't have a way of charging their batteries except when the motor's running. And you're not moving for more than an hour to an hour and a half a day anyway. And so you have to run your diesel engine just to keep the fridge running and to pull the, the anchor up. And if you're only motoring for an hour and you have to run the, the diesel for the hour to charge, you may as well just motor instead of sail because the motor's running anyway. So, you know, it just has to do with how the boat is set up and, and our boat's set up to not need, uh, not need a diesel the generator, you know, like, yeah, we, we, when we're sailing, we can create power and the solar creates power and we can sail really easily from mm-hmm. three knots of true wind all the way up to 35, 40 knots of true wind. We're completely happy sailing. I think the beauty of yeah. the med too is that, I mean, there are some choppy ways, but you don't have this big Atlantic swells exactly. as well. So you don't have to worry about yeah, br- like giant that. breaking waves. But I feel like it's not like it's an unknown fact. Like in the med, you have a lot of times where there's no wind and a lot of times there's a lot of wind. So I feel like <laughs> most boats going there can- should take that in consideration. Like, okay, I'm going into the med. Let me- let's make sure I have my, you know, my strong reefs. I have all my reefs and my sails. I have a, a storm, storm sail. sail. Yeah. And also, parallelly, I also have the... Um, light wind oh, sails yeah. because that's how you're going to be able to maneuver comfortably in the in the med without not to motor all the time. We've had yeah. m- way more times in less than ten knots of wind than more than forty knots of wind. If that makes sense. Oh, um, of course you would. Yeah. Like we sail and it, and and the light winds are high pressure systems, right? So like if you can set your boat up to sail well in less than ten knots of wind, you're always going to be sailing in sunshine and happiness. And if you are set your boat up to sail in 40 knots of wind, it's always going to be rainy and cold and shitty because those are low pressure systems, right? You never get 40 knots of wind when it's sunny, um, at least not that I know of. 
Um, so <laughs> at least not yet. <laughs> that's kind of where we tie back into like to us. A blue water boat is lighter and faster with a higher aspect ratio uh, sail plan because you can always reef it down. But if you can get your boat sailing to wind speed in three, four, five, up to ten knots of wind, like you're golden because you can choose better weather, calmer weather, s- smaller waves, and you can actually get out of the way when the low pressures come through. Low pressures are usually pretty small. High pressures are usually pretty big. You got a lot more like surface area of the ocean you can sail on if you're happy under 10 knots than yeah. if you're setting your boat up for hurricane force winds. And I think that's how we, we've managed to take that boat in this condition. Yeah. Um, in all of these places is because we know we had the like light enough sails and the proper sails to go in lighter winds. So when we calculate the passage, we calculate it for better passages and better wind condition because mm-hmm. we knew we could sail through the, the comfortable sails. And yeah, we got caught in like some strong winds, but I wouldn't say like we got caught in it. No. It was more like we would sail conf- conservatively in stronger winds, but we yeah. would try our best to pick the lighter winds and still sail yeah. through them. For instance, our yeah. sail from Scotland down to France was three days downwind with a spinnaker in October. Um, and nice. our sail across <laughs> Biscay, yeah, our sail across Biscay was four days in May, um, with the code zero out and less than 10 knots of wind beam reaching. And like, it was, it was five to 10 knots of wind and we were sailing at like five to six knots on the beam sunshine yeah. four days across Biscay in the spring. Yeah. Um, cause we just choose to sail in lighter, better, sunnier weather. And we yeah. get it. Like, not all people have that luxury. Some people are on schedule and, like, that kind of makes sense. But then, like, seriously, we, we kind of start to question, like, why get a sailboat then? Like, if you're, if you're on a schedule and you only get a one-week vacation to go to the Bahamas, like, why are you doing it on your sailboat? We could just do it in a yeah, powerboat. So you're not going to save that much yeah. time or money. Get a, get a catamaran, like a motor catamaran, yeah, and then sure. you'll have a wonderful time. Because... Cause, because the thing yeah. is, too, like you get a sailboat, a rig. you're motoring anyway. Yeah. So get a powerboat. Like there's nothing wrong with a motorboat. And if you're in a hurry, get an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot yeah, of cool. um, there's a lot of argument for getting a trawler in the med <laughs> rather than a sailboat. But it's like you say, it depends yeah, on what I mean, type of uh, sails you've you got. Don't even and the, need one. But, you yeah. know, the thing is, it's like when when you buy a boat, you've got the diesel engine in there. You know, it might cost five dollars or ten dollars an hour to keep it turned on. Whereas, if you need Jenica and you need a Code Zero and you want like a, exactly. a symmetrical spinnaker or whatever, you could be looking like that could be thirty grand to get those free sails yep. if you've got a big yeah. boat. You know, if you've got yep. like a fifty foot boat, and sure. you have to really be determined to actually sail so it. Actually Otherwise, sail. Yeah. it's kind of a waste of money if you're just if you have all the sails well, and you're still motoring everywhere. Yeah. Not, you know, there's no and, point getting the sailboat. And point. not having a diesel engine in our boat from the very beginning and only having that crappy little forklift motor we could motor for 15 minutes or whatever forced us to become <laughs> good sailors, right? Like, like we started yeah. without the motor, so we were like, oh, we need a spinnaker. Like, we need reefs in our mainsail. We need to learn how to tack in a channel. Like, um, have you ever been to Florida? Yeah, many times, know, yeah. Um, the Biscayne Bay, like down near Miami? No, not from a sailing perspective, no. So, so Biscayne, I think it's Biscayne Bay. Biscayne, yeah, Biscayne. yeah. So there's like a, there's a channel on the north side that you can come in with the cruise ships and it's very narrow and you're in a lot of commercial traffic. And there's a channel on the south side that it looks like wide open ocean because there's sort of like a barrier reef that goes along the edge of the bay and there's only like one channel through it. It's three nautical miles long, I think. But it, it, it looks like open ocean. There's no like islands right so there's just like some some red and green posts going out we tacked 43 times when we left biscayne bay to get out into the gulf stream in three miles we tacked 40 that's how narrow the channel was and it was, we were tacking against the trade winds um if we had a diesel of course we would have motored against it like no purist out there like there's nobody who has a <laughs> None of them diesel that wouldn't that motor against it. they're like yeah. oh we'll just we'll fine we'll sail it like like we were tacking you know within five feet of the markers or, or like the bow would go over, but we knew our keel wasn't there yet. And we would tack before the keel made it to the shallow section, even though the bow was over the shallow <laughs> section. Like, like we learned how to sail in and out of a slip and on and onto a dock under sail, not motor because we didn't have a way to charge our motor. So we never used it. So like we had to learn all those skills like really early on. 
which meant later on we always prioritize sailing, not motoring. Um, yeah. And if, yeah, you're right. If you already have a diesel motor and yeah, you know, it costs four bucks an hour to run it, that's nothing. You run it for three hours, 12 bucks. Like you're not going to notice that. But mm -hmm. if you don't have a diesel motor, you're going to learn how to sail real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was kind of a blessing in disguise, really, because I know that when you first got that yeah. boat, because I watched your videos uh, apparently nine years ago. I, I didn't know it had been that long. It was quite surprising when you said that. I was oh like, gosh. gosh, I was like only 30 when I started watching uh, those people sail. Um, yeah, that was weird. Um, but you were forced into it, which is probably a great thing in a way, because it would have... Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how far you would have got if you wouldn't have been forced into that situation, because you definitely wouldn't be as good a sailors. Um you know, you possibly we would have been have like everybody locations. else, stuck in a yeah. stuck in a, a harbor somewhere, waiting for an alternator belt to come in, so that we could like keep our keep going on our sailing adventure, right? Like all of the time we haven't had to spend on parts coming in uh, and waiting on spare parts and oil changes and stuff, it's been huge. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely prioritized our our actual sailing skills and prioritized all the upgrades we've made to our boat to make it easier to sail than it is to motor. And since we've, this is the first boat we've had, and this is the only setup we've ever had, like we've, we've modified along the way, but now that we're starting to get on other people's boats more and visit other cruising friends, like over the years, we've met a lot of people and we start talking about problems that they've had and just things that we just like never even have had to think about, like turning on the diesel engine to hoist the anchor. You know, most boats, you have to have the engine running because the windlass uses too much power. Uh, so you can't run off the battery. And we're like, oh, yeah, I guess that's a thing. Like, because we were sailing along looking at all the charter boats going like, it's blowing 12 knots, like on the beam. Like, why aren't you sailing? Like mm -hmm. you rented a <laughs> sailboat for the week. And then we started learning about like that they have to motor anyway. Um, or, or, you know, having to run your diesel just to charge your batteries, just to keep the refrigerator running is such an inefficient way to do anything because that alternator's tiny. And if you put a bigger alternator on it and it's stressing the engine, like there's all of these like complicated systems. There's whole chapters in our boat maintenance books. We don't even have to look at about diesel maintenance and alternators and lead acid batteries. Yeah. Um, I think I think what we found from like seeing other people's boat and going on, a, on other friends' boats is that right now with how boats are set up and how boats are built, it's easier to motor than to sail. Yeah. Like it's convenient to motor and it's inconvenient it's, to sail. It's required. Like if you have a sailboat, you have to run your diesel engine. Yeah. And so I think it should be flipped. It should be easier to sail than motor. Like motor yeah. can still be part of it. Like if you need it, like it's there. But the fact that sailing right now is, is like seen as this complicated thing that, you know, you really have to be passionate about it just to do it for like the next hour. But for the most time, you're going to be motoring because it's just easier. But I feel like if there's a way to change it up so that yeah. it's actually enjoyable and easy to set your sails up and to actually sail, then motoring, you can do it for a little while if you have to. But yeah, I think it should, it should just be flipped. Yeah. I mean, in, in an ideal world, hybrid electrics would be the perfect solution. Like, because the, the really cool part about the way our boat's set up now is that we can, you know, motor out of a marina motor for two or three miles out of a channel while we get our sails set up and put our fenders away and everything. We don't have to start tacking like as soon as we pass the fuel dock. Um, and then, you know, we can sail all afternoon and by the time we make it to the next um, anchorage or whatever, our batteries are charged back up from the propeller spinning in the water. Um, because no amount of solar on a monohull will ever be able to put in as much power as we can make from our propeller spinning in the water. Um, How many amps do you get On from a catamaran, that? Uh, so at, at four and a half knots, we start to break even. So we'll be making around 150 to 200 Watts, um, at, at four and a half, five knots, that's where it kicks on. And then if we're, if we're up in like the six and a half to seven knots, like if we're on like a beam reach and 20 knots of wind full sail, we're cruising, it'll be making 600 to 700 Watts, um, which you, you can absolutely get 700 Watts out of solar panels but not 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. No, um, no. <laughs> like when, when we were sailing up to Svalbard, in one day our batteries were fully charged and like we didn't have a reason to have regen on after that because we went, we, we just charged all the way right back up again. Um, 
Because it was there was no nighttime. It was yeah, and if time. you're if you're in a boat that can that can do averages of like nine ten knots, like a decent monohull or or a, an even more decent catamaran, <laughs> most of those don't do ten knots either. Um, then you're looking at like a kilowatt, and if you're on a catamaran or a monohull with two That's two crazy. motors, then you're looking at a kilowatt each. So you're yeah. looking at two kilowatts for twenty four hours a day. Uh, and it's slowing you down maybe the third of a knot, maybe half a knot, but you can't actually tell. It's not like you put the, it's not like you turn regen on and all of a sudden your boat goes slower. Like we've looked at the graph of our speed through the water and it goes from like six and a half to five and a half constantly anyway. Uh, cause you're on a sailboat. And so when you turn region on, you're like looking to see if there's like an overall drop and you just can't. Yeah. I mean, out. if you're racing, maybe those like millisecond sure. matter, but yeah, yeah. if you're cruising, like your, your speed get effect, gets affected by current by the wind, by the waves. Like every time you surf down a wave, you go faster, you go up a wave, you go slower. So like you don't really notice a difference anyway. anyway. So yeah, so like managing how much slower you go because of the propeller, it doesn't really make a difference, especially if you have a fast enough boat. And our argument for that is also, we went from a shaft drive with a fixed three bay propeller to a sail drive with a feathering propeller. We gained a full knot of boat speed just by not dragging the propeller through the water. So the fact that then we're losing like maybe a third or a half knot, it's still an improvement. Matter. We're still net positive <laughs> on a faster boat because we have a sail drive. Yeah, I think in the <laughs> end, as long as you're making more power than you're losing, then yeah. regen is viable. So our like if you can sail at five and a half knots or so on average or six knots, then then regen's viable. If you can sail faster, it's a no brainer. Um, because you can like run air conditioning in the middle of the ocean, you can make water, you can have a microwave, you can have an induction stove. Like it's, if you've got two, if you've got two electric, if well, servo props, I don't want to say electric motor cause, um, not yeah. all electric motors are made equally as None we've, are. as we've known. Um, <laughs> we're about to put out a whole video about that. So, um, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting that the whole industry is shifting. Like when we started, nobody was doing electric motors on boats. Um, and now it seems like everybody who's buying a boat, not everybody, a lot more people buying boats want them to be electric or hybrid electric and manufacturers are all offering them to be electric, but they're then spending six months talking them out of putting in electric because they start selling all the cons of electric because the manufacturers don't want to deal with installing a new system that they don't know how to install and get complicated and then warrantying a new system that they've never warranted before. And so it's much easier just to put back in a Volvo Penta. So they'll, they, they tend to discourage new owners from going electric by selling them all the negatives so that they end up with a diesel anyway, or they just won't. And so we know some people are getting catamarans from certain manufacturers in Vietnam who, um, are having to buy new diesels for their boat and then they're buying the boat sailing around the corner ripping out the diesels and putting in electrics which is insane yeah uh especially just financially that's insane but also like it's insane that a manufacturer just refuses to do something like that because yeah. they don't want to warranty a, a new a new but that's another example of false advertisement right yeah. because like on paper they look better if they say, yeah, of course, we, we're going to install electric on our, all of our boats if the mm -hmm. owner wants it. But that's because it makes the company look good. But when it comes to it, the, the owner wants like, hey, I want electric on my boat. I think out of like all the manufacturers that we've talked to and visited, I think only like one or two actually are serious about, yeah, if the owner wants an electric, we're going to put, put it, it in. On. Yeah. And the, the problem, too, is that um, now it seems like everyone's offering an electric motor. Like if you go to Metz, the trade show in, in the Netherlands, like there's dozens of companies offering electric motors for their um, sailboats or for uh, power boats, whatever, uh, which is great, awesome. But there's still only one that's actually taking regen seriously, which is the one we have installed on our boats, the Ocean Vrolt servo prop. None of the other, like they all say like regen capable, but none of them will post um, data on their websites about like how fast you need to be going to get what amount of power because yeah every electric motor is technically capable of regen but but none of them are actually viable when it comes to actually putting on a sailboat and actually sailing they're not going to create enough power to charge your batteries back up and so in our opinion if you're going electric you need to be on a sailboat if you're going electric on a sailboat regen needs to be the priority because you have sails that's where all of your power is going to come from 
And if you're going electric and you aren't going to get regen, which every other electric motor won't, then you need a generator, in which case on a powerboat or like a day sail or whatever, but maybe it's, there's a use case where that makes sense. But if you're just running a generator to charge your battery to run your electric motor, like it kind of defeats the whole purpose in our opinion. So if you can get good regen while you're sailing, you'll cover 90% of your motoring needs through regen, solar, and sails. And then, yeah, that one time a year where you need to deliver the boat back to the boat yard or pick up your friend at the airport and you've got a motor 300 miles in two days, then you have a generator. Cool. But you also don't need to run the generator to hoist your sails, run the bow thruster, make water, like run the induction stove. You don't need the generator for anything other than a range extender, which means it can be much smaller as well. You need like a four kilowatt generator, not a 13 or 15 kilowatt generator. Mm -hmm. So, because you can motor at five knots happily. You don't need to be motoring at eight and you don't need to be motoring at eight you know, while charging up your batteries, you can just motor at five. Um, so yeah, this, there's a lot of like misinformation uh, in the boat building side of yeah. sailboats from <laughs> from how they're built. Yeah, I think we just highlight what few. engines they're putting in them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also yeah. like I mean, not to to go <clears throat> too much into that conversation because that's gonna that's gonna take another hour. But there's also uh, I think misclassification when it comes to electric motors. Like yeah. a lot of people call themselves all electric or hybrid electric yeah, yeah. and i mean there's it's either or or nothing right but there's so much more in the middle than yeah. than just electric like the, the all electric the pure all electric is no fuel at all on your boat right and that's like the extreme side we've right? never even been that because we've always had a dinghy engine yeah you know like so and then and then the, <laughs> or the a, problem or a propane stove yeah exactly like we <laughs> our boat itself is electric but we do have other systems like yeah, yeah. we can push our boat with our outboard motor which is uh, like petrol, we can. Um, we now we have the the little gas generator, which yeah. we can use as a kind of an extender. But also even the hybrid electric, right? Because like a lot of people say, oh, we have an electric component, therefore yeah. it's hybrid. But there's a difference between hybrid electric and hybrid diesel. Like if yeah. you have a diesel engine and an electric what alternator, then it's not an electric yeah, system. Yeah. It's just a diesel with an extra part. But if you have an electric motor and then like a diesel like generator on the side, then it becomes a proper hybrid. There needs to be a classification between yeah. like what's on the shaft. You know, yeah, like if you have a diesel engine on your shaft with a really big alternator that can also spin the propeller, sure, that's diesel, maybe diesel electric or diesel or hybrid. Or hybrid like diesel or something like Hybrid diesel like that. something, yeah. but like the diesel is the primary source of propulsion. And yeah, you can like motor on and off anchor with your little electric motor yeah um and yeah if, if there's not a diesel on the prop shaft and it's it's like a proper series hybrid system so you have like a diesel that charges your batteries and your batteries run your electric then then that should be like hybrid electric or some version of that but there's got to be a classification system because there's a huge difference between all the different systems out there and what they're actually designed for mm -hmm. um because if you've got a diesel engine with an alternator on it you're primarily going to be running it as a diesel engine. Um, yeah, no matter I guess, how like purist you plan on being, it's yeah, just it, easier to start up your diesel engine. Or, I mean, it depends how dependent your boat is on an electric system versus yeah, yeah. a diesel system, right? Like if, <laughs> if, if your boat requires you to turn on diesel, then it's not electric. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's if, primarily diesel. Or if you've got a diesel hybrid, so it's got the electric motor on the shaft as well, but then you don't have much solar and your boat can't sail fast enough to get regen or the system's not designed to get regen. The problem with all of the, I guess we'll call them diesel like hybrids are, um, you're not going to get regen because your your propeller is going to be on a shaft drive and it's not going to have the gear ratios to get the, the motor spinning fast enough to get regen. Yeah, Even if you're sailing power. at 10 knots, like you're not going to get viable regen. There's just going to be too much drag in that system. Um, and if you've got like hybrid electric, then you could if you had like a servo prop, but not if you're shaft drive and not if you have the wrong propeller. Like there's so many variables that go into it. Mm. Um, and we've talked to, uh, who we're talking to? We're talking to Volvo Penta about their new electric motor they were coming out with. And we were talking to the reps and we were like, so what are the regen numbers? Because every time we walk around boat shows now, all the electric motor manufacturers are like, hey, like, how many, you, guys, you guys want our electric motor? Like, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, show us the regen <laughs> numbers. And consistently, the feedback is always, why would we ever want to permanently, why would we ever purposely slow down a sailboat? 
And we're like, why would you want to put an electric motor in if you just have to run a generator to charge it anyway? Like that yeah, makes it defeats no the sense. purpose of what, what they're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. exactly. Because you still have to maintain a diesel, listen to a diesel, fuel the diesel. Like you still have to do all the stuff you need to do to a diesel. You just like are burning a bit less of it. But you live on a sailboat. You're already burning way less diesel than like anything else forms of living. Like <laughs> Any other less means than of a car, travel. less than a house, less than... <laughs> Yeah, any other yeah. means of travel. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're still burning way less. So, like, if you burn a thousand liters of diesel a year versus 250 liters of diesel a year on a sailboat, there's so few of them. Like, I don't really see that making much difference in the whole world. <laughs> but like, it, but it's actually it, it's not even that because you're managing an electric motor and a diesel motor exactly. at this point. Your diesel motor will break because that just happens. Yeah, it so like the, the amount of fuel that you're saving, you're still spending on getting parts and getting yeah. maintenance and hauling out and all this stuff just to fix that diesel component. So if you're trying to be better to the environment, it's not really that much better to have a diesel motor yeah. and also a diesel engine. Well, and you're and still, also an electric motor. You're still <laughs> buying into that system, right? So here's the other thing is that if you've got a big diesel engine with an electric like alternator on it that can run the prop shafts like a, a diesel hybrid you're still buying into like the 30 years of owning a diesel engine because that's your primary means of propulsion it's a diesel engine that comes with an electric motor on it and so you're you're stuck with that system whereas if you've got a serial hybrid like your primary system is electric you've got the batteries you've got the solar you've got the sails you've got regen the generator becomes disposable like we call our generator a guaranteed sunny day because we can run it for two for two hours and it makes us the same amount of power as our solar panels do in a day. And so when we were up north and it was cloudy or dark, like in Norway above the Arctic Circle in the winter, there is no sunshine. So solar doesn't work. Um, but it's also, it becomes sort of disposable. Like if it breaks, we can like pick it up, walk it over to a, a Honda dealer and be like, fix it. Or we mm -hmm. can take it out and fix it ourselves. Um, but it's not like a permanent part of our system. It's just... Or if there's a better version that comes out or a fuel cell or a hydrogen fuel cell that actually puts out usable amounts of power, it just becomes like an additional way to charge your batteries. We've got regen, we've got solar, you can get wind and you can get a little generator. So it's, it's, it, it's not like a primary part of the system. It's just sort of a secondary thing that we have for convenience. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's another whole difference. But yeah, we, we're, we're coming up with a whole series of videos on that. Soon because, because yeah, there's a lot of transformation in the industry. Yeah, I think the classification of diesel well. and electric. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's going to turn some. That's going to raise some questions, isn't it? I think it's a proper yeah. debate. <laughs> a proper debate. I mean, I th that's the point, right? Because if we don't raise, if somebody doesn't raise questions, that everybody's going to fall back to the traditional way of calling things the way they are, the, yeah. of of thinking. Uh, like everybody's going to have their own opinion for something, which is good. But like people need to agree especially when it comes to the industry and how boats are designed, people do need to agree on a certain standard. And if we don't raise questions, mm. then yeah. nobody's going to try to question it. Nobody's going to try to debate it. And I think it's wh whether it goes well or it goes poorly, at least people will start talking about it. Yeah. I think that, that's the goal anyway. Yeah. No, and it's the right thing to do because I think if there is ever going to be any change like within the industry, it's not going to come from the people that are building the stuff because they're just, they've got a great model like boats, take years to even obtain now like you have to be on a waiting list and you have to compete with yeah. charter businesses yeah. and other owners so like if the if the challenge is coming from the consumer um yeah then change is probable or government whichever way but i just think looking at it like if if it, it's it's just quite strange that cars are so heavily regulated now where there's no way you could put like an yeah. agricultural or marine diesel engine in a car. That would be so illegal. No country would even allow that anymore. So like the idea yeah. Yeah. that, you know, cars have to be so insanely tuned and regulated when it comes to like burning fossil fuels is wild compared to like, oh, it's a boat that floats, just stick an engine from the 1950s because there's there's no difference. Like the shit that they pump out is the same no. as the diesel engines that they were making 50 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And it's fine. Absolutely. Like, it's quite strange. I, it's, it's so strange. And honestly, I don't even think cars are... Be, because yes, cars, like you have thousands of cars in every city, you know, that are so close together. There's a lot of traffic. So yeah, they need to be a little bit more regulated because there's so many chances of having an accident and impacting someone else. But... Think of planes, for instance, right? You can't buy a plane and not have it properly certified. Yeah. You can't 
even if it's a small plane that you buy yourself that you want you can't really do anything unless you can't fly it unless one is an experimental plane and it needs a, the, the different type of certification or it's a, a proper certified plane and you have the standard yeah. certification that all planes needs to have and i think that's the that's the mentality that we should start, ha start having for sailboats like they need to have the standard certification that it doesn't need to be a rated b rated c rated it's like it just needs to be rated as a base the when, same way for every single boat out there when we bought our boat everyone told us we needed to get it surveyed and we thought that was like an official thing and we like we're just now probably fixing some of the issues that were in the survey everything we fixed in the last nine years weren't even in the survey and then we realized that surveyors aren't regulated there's no set standard there's no rules they have to follow it's just like some guy that comes through and taps on your boat with a screwdriver and says like probably fine give me a five six hundred bucks there the surveyors yeah. are more for the insurance <laughs> company it's more like it's more like uh uh it's like a notary you know it's like somebody looked at the boat other than the seller and the buyer and what it's listed what's listed in the listing is what is in front of this person and it's more for the the bank when they give you a loan and the insurance than it is for you um but yeah it's nuts that there's not like even when you get buy a house you have to get your house inspected for mold and electrics and like you know there's no legal requirement to actually have any kind of like there's no s proper certificate there's no proper set standard of like what a boat needs to have in order to sell it um it's it's one of the things we love about living on a boat is like we, we don't have do any this. license saying we can do this i know but i was gonna can. say you, you, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but i think there's a difference <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just nice, which we love because we went to architecture school and we learned all of the code that is involved with building houses and structures. And we're like, this sucks. There's too many rules. Like, what can we yeah. live in with even <laughs> cars? There's so many rules. And so when we found boats and we're like, you mean there's no rules? Like none? Like zero? We can do whatever we want. We can do anything we want. Like, I, let's do that. We yeah. wouldn't have been able to do what we've done with the electric motor in a car. Uh, no, no you know, it, it, there's too much certification and regulation to get around. It would have cost too much money. You can't just like take a forklift motor off eBay and put it <laughs> in your car and drive it around on public roads. It'd yeah. be insane. No. <laughs> but I think there's a difference between like working on your own boat and, and do whatever you want versus a production line selling oh, sure. a new boat. For sure. Right? Like, yeah, just like, I mean, I'm going to go back to airplanes because it's kind yeah. of a new passion of ours to just look into airplanes now. But we... Like we, we've looked at the, there's experimental airplanes where people can basically do whatever they want, call it an experimental airplane and then just like test it out, right? There's yeah. limitations to it, but you can still do it. But then if a, if a company decides to sell airplanes, it needs to be a proper yeah. standard. It needs to, you can't just sell a new boat and be like, yeah, 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 it could be whatever it wants. You don't have any regulations. You don't have any limitations and no strings attached in six and six. Yeah, it's like that doesn't... It's your own problem. I, like, no, if you want to build an experimental boat and and sail it around, that's fine. But you shouldn't be allowed to sell it until it passes some sort of like set standard certification. Mm -hmm. And I think new boat manufacturers need to have that same set standard certification. Other than like it's a class A ocean ready boat, which doesn't mean anything. Yeah, and I don't know who or what government or what like organization <laughs> needs to start to get yeah. that to to Soul to be something like... that's viable that people actually see it but I think eventually like some somebody out there needs to start this. Yeah. So your, your mic's also going to die soon I think. It's on red. Yeah. Yeah, I've got I've <laughs> How got long like is this podcast? <laughs> five minutes. I've got 5 minutes left on my uh, camera but no, I was just going to say like the OIA would be a great a great body to actually yeah. promote something like this. I just don't think they've got any balls as an organization. Like there's been loads of yeah. stuff over the past few years, especially with the Brexit stuff that we've had. They had a great opportunity to like try and promote some type of change when it comes to visas or cruisers traveling or whatever. Somebody at the OIA mm -hmm. is going to hate me for saying this, but I think it's true, but they could, um, <laughs> they could, they could do something super positive for the industry there when it comes to that. The problem that you got is like, no matter where a car is made, it needs to be certified to go on a British road or a Canadian road or a Haitian road. Yeah. It, wherever a boat is made anywhere in the world, there's no specific regulations. And if you said to like lagoons no. that were made in, I don't, like leopards, I know leopards are made in South Africa. So if you say leopards that are made in South Africa mm -hmm. and then Benetos that are made in France, 
they all have to now be certified to each individual country's regulations when it comes to cruising in their waters. That's so difficult. It's so difficult, and I don't know if it would even it be would possible be on that scale. Yeah. 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 It would almost have to be like some. It would almost have to be like a private organization that just sets like a like a gold star standard or like whatever the thing is. Like yeah, um, they do that in restaurants. Yeah, when they do it in um, uh, <laughs> they do it in cars in the states. I don't remember what they call it, but like it's like an independent verification thing, and then you can like put that stamp on your branding and say it's independently yeah. like a CE a CE rating or a GL rating or whatever it is, right? Like that's an independent organization and everything has to have a UL rating. Yeah, so that means, it doesn't mean that the boat can't be sold, but it means like people prioritize having that stamp on their certification because then they're like, oh, it's, it's. I'm just going to say it's like B, B rating or yeah, I, I was going to say blue water. Yeah, can't because that's, yeah, yeah. But, but it's some- It's X, X, X rating, then this must be great. <laughs> <laughs> For some people. Well, Lloyd's, uh, Lloyd's used to do it. So the Lloyd's Register, they yeah. were a big quality, you know, uh, quality inspection. They used to do insurance stuff like loads. Um, but yeah. uh, that was a whole, my old boat, I had a Moody and like one of the, one of the proudest things that those yards, you know, spoke about was that our boats are all Lloyd's registered and it means they've all reached a certain quality standard of build. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think any boats are even interested in getting any of that type of stuff anymore. So I don't think they need yeah. to. I don't think they the want demand, to. The demand is so high for them that they don't care. People will buy a boat yeah. no matter what. I don't know why, but it's weird. I, and also because like you said earlier, Andy, you were saying that boats are built for charter. I don't think the company wants to have that stamp or even the, the like the I don't want I don't think they want publicly to know that they're being like audited to get that stamp because then if they fail it's a big risk for the company. Yeah. Well, and so, charter boats are built for five years. Like every time a hurricane goes through all the all the moorings and sun sail, they just kind of like tie all their boats up in a harbor with shoestrings and like hope the hurricane doesn't hit. And then the hurricane comes through and knocks out their whole fleet and their insurance company buys them a whole new fleet of boats. Mm -hmm. Like they're yeah. meant to be disposable. <laughs> and then they all just float them down to the Dominican Republic where they sit on the hard and like get scrapped. I mean, it's, it's absolutely nuts what, what the charter industry does to get new boats. Um, they're basically disposable. They're built as disposable boats. Yeah, something it's needs the same to change with like the car rental industry as well. Like if you, especially in mainland Europe, like if you look at like uh, Renault, Opel, a lot of these type of companies, Fiat, mm -hmm. they're making so many cars for just like car rental companies, and it's the same. Like they get them and yeah. they're just good for a few years. Then all the bits start breaking, right, pumps, motors. It's the same stuff that goes wrong on boats. But yeah, they're just made for like a. For just an easy consumer do you know what i mean somebody who doesn't care they're just going to pick it up for a week dump it off it's not a big deal don't yeah. need to worry about maintenance these will last like one or two years and then it gets yeah. scrapped or sold and they replace or... it and yeah, then yeah. yeah exactly yeah so it's the same uh. thing right let's end it there um otherwise i think we'll just keep on talking for probably years. i know it's <laughs> easy to talk <laughs> It's easy to talk about boats. Yeah, it's a good one. Well, listen, yeah. thank you very much for um, giving us some of your opinions about boat manufacturers. That's super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and electric motors. Absolutely. That's been really well, cool. thank you for, uh, yeah, thank you for having us.